thank you all for coming and I am very, very excited that we are having this tonight. I am genuinely excited and as a matter of protocol and a matter of mark of respect, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we um, here in the Newtown office are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land and I would like to encourage you at this point if you want to to use the chat to acknowledge the country that you're joining from uh, tonight uh, or in Chanel's case this morning. Um, if you are on Aboriginal land and um, it would be great if you could acknowledge country of where you're joining from, because we know that the injustice for First Nations people continue. We know that we need to always acknowledge elders past, present and emerging, but we need to recognise as well the incredible women leaders, First Nations women leaders who have actually driven the struggle for justice and need us to add our strength and our support to their ongoing challenges so that we realise justice and sovereignty for First Nations people in this country. It is clear that we are at an absolute turning point when it comes to the push for justice for women, not just in this state, not just in this country, but around the globe. And in the last few months, we have seen what I would describe as a new generation of young women and young people who are basically sparking and amplifying this push that has been a struggle that has been happening for decades and centuries before. We are seeing also, sadly, some horrific examples of patriarchy and misogyny that, and clearly the power structures that we need to overthrow and no, non, as I like to say, non-violently smash. We've seen huge mobilizations. The March for Justice has seen thousands of people out on the streets. We've seen spontaneous and organized activisms and speak outs of survivors, huge online engagements with thousands of young women and people making testimonies and making support. We've seen the New South Wales Premier, the Prime Minister engage well or badly, depending on your views of what they were doing at what time, trying to tackle this issue. And just today, we've seen the Premier committing to recommendations to address sexual assault and harassment in ministerial offices, although I think we would all agree that so much more needs to be done. We've seen the New South Wales Attorney General committing to potential reforms around the Crimes Act when it comes to consent, but will he go far enough and will they make this the priority it needs to be? We've seen a swift outcry across the board from the inadequate and confusing attempts to educate and talk to young people about consent. And if I could say one thing, it is that we want more tea and less milkshakes. And we have also seen heated debates around misogyny, victim blaming, gaslighting, sexual violence, power imbalance within our parliaments, our schools, our society, our workplaces. And it is clear that there is a renewed appetite for change. But we also know, even though this has shifted, that we can no longer rest on the fact that people are convinced that this change will happen. We have seen these movements rise up before. What we need to look at now is how do we set the agenda to make sure that we achieve meaningful reform so that this isn't another moment that flies up without delivering the outcomes that we need. How do we build that shift and that change to change people's hearts, to change their minds, to wrestle equality from the patriarchal powers that be? That is our challenge. And tonight, I believe that these women who have joined us to be part of this panel are leading that charge. I believe that if we are going to develop meaningful reform, then the people tonight are going to set that agenda. And so I am absolutely honoured to have this stellar lineup of people here tonight to be able to speak to you so that you can engage and connect with them and hear their ideas and we can celebrate them and the work that they contribute. So I would like to go through, I'm going to give a very, very brief intro of all of them and let them say hi to you and introduce themselves a little bit so we can run through the amazing eight panellists. Bear with me because this is a massive feat to deal with Zoom and eight panellists and all of you there, but we're going to try and get through it and my speed talking hopefully will uh, speed us through. So 
First of all, I'd like to introduce to you Erin O'Leary, who's a Dungadi activist and co-founder of Youth Survivors for Justice, who non-violently smashed it with her speech at the recent town hall snap action with survivors speaking out. Erin and Danny, who you'll hear from in a minute, organised what I consider to be the best action that I have been to in many, many years. And as you would know, if you know me, I go to quite a few number of actions. So Erin, I'll pass to you. Please say hello and welcome. Hi, hi. Um, as Jenny said, I'm Erin. I'm a Dungadi woman land in the, in the same office as Jenny. Um, yeah. So I'm. Um, I don't. I'm not sure how long I'm. I'm speaking for, but um, I'll quickly give you a little bit of a intro. Um, as Jenny said, I'm a co-founder of um, You Survivors for Justice, along with Danny and some other amazing young women and people. Um, we organised a rally March twelfth. Um, with, with four days um, so that 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 really means a lot um, Jenny we had four days to organize it um, me and Danny are um, a climate activist but um, yeah it's just this was like this was a really really big deal and something that um, really meant a lot to us and it's the support around it has meant even more to us and I think um, really fueled our fires even more um, yeah yeah um, uh, we also should probably plug the next rally, uh, May 8th, Town Hall, 1pm. Hopefully it will be bigger and better. We've got um, endorsements from um, the National Tertiary Education Union and, um, yeah, the NTU, and it, it should be really amazing. So I'm so grateful to be here. It's such a cool panel, such a cool opportunity. So thank you very much. And thank you for letting me sit in the office, Jenny. No Much appreciate problem. No problem, Erin. I'm glad that we could provide that support. And um, Danny Villafania, I'll um, throw to you now, if I may, another co-founder of Youth Survivors for Justice and part of that action. Also, um, currently, I should say both of these incredible women, Erin and Danny, are both still high school students and are leading the charge. So I just want to acknowledge, Danny, hi, how are you going? And um, welcome. Hi, and thank you so, so much for having me here. Just like Erin, I co-founded and organised with Youth Survivors for Justice, and we're a collective of young people, mostly high school students and survivors ourselves, who are really pushing for change. We mobilised on March 12th, as Erin said, and we're mobilizing again next next Saturday at Town Hall, that's May 8th, to really push for change. And we're hoping to have a good turnout from other students just like us who want to see something different to what we've been having to put up with for years. And I say years as if I'm not only 17, but we're hoping we'll see something different. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Danny. I'm, I'll introduce you next to Saxon Mullins, who's the Director of Advocacy and Rape and Sexual Assault Research, sorry, the Director of Advocacy at the Rape and Sexual Assault Research Advocacy Centre and also a 2018 Human Rights Medalist. Thank you, Saxon, so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like Jenny, I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Mighty Eora Nation. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, as Jenny mentioned, I'm the Director of Advocacy at an organisation that has a very long name, but the short name is Rosara. Um, and we're working in the space of consent law and relationship and sexuality education spaces, um, which have been uh, lacking very much in, for many, many years, but recently maybe people are listening. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Saxon. Next, Dania Marnie, I'll throw to you. Dania is the founder of Changing Our Headlines, Breaking Down Barriers to Campaign for Safe, Healthy and Feminist Culture in Australian Political Life, Workplaces and Beyond. Um, Dania, I think you've rejoined us. I just want to check. Danya was having issues with... I've now unmuted myself. Amazing. Welcome, Danya. Danya was having issues with Wi-Fi, which is a reality of this life. Welcome, Danya. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Cool. Did you want to say anything a little bit about you and introduce yourself to start? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I think this sort of period of time has been obviously incredibly difficult, um, you know, as somebody who was a political staffer um, and who also, you know, was a friend of, of Kate's. Um, it's 
it's just been incredibly difficult to see the resistance that's existed at a federal level when it comes to simply recognising the humanity of, of a woman like Kate and dignifying that with the inquiry that she so clearly deserves. Um, it's frustrating to see a political circus around defamation proceedings rather than genuine respect for procedural fairness, which was meant to be what people respected. And I think, you know, to... Um, we saw the Goward report come out today at a state level. And I think it's it's frustrating to see, you know, reports coming down both federally and at a state level that haven't actually included the input of survivors in the um, in sort of the actual writing um, and drafting of reports, including survivors as authors. Uh, and I think an important shift that needs to occur is rather than survivors being individuals whose stories and experiences are collected for the use of other individuals and for the agendas of others, survivors need to be allowed to author um, that agenda and be part of producing those documents um, and be part of creating that reform. I think we share our stories because we're passionate about policy reform. And so I'm hopeful through the advocacy work that I've been doing over the past couple of years to um, create a space for survivors to amplify their voices and be those agents of change. Thanks so much, Danya. And I think it certainly is something that we're going to come back to when we enter into the discussion as well, is how we centre and are led by survivors and people who have experienced sexual assault when we're developing the changes and the reforms that are needed. Um, I'd like to introduce next Jamie Evans, who's the director of Women's March Sydney um, and the lead uh, of the Sydney chapter of March for Justice. Um, basically, if there was anybody that knows how to organise an action big and quickly, <laughs> it is Jamie uh, and also how to just step up and say yeah sure let's do one of those like in five days without anything being planned in advance so all power to Jamie we met um, organizing actions around the decriminalization of abortion in New South Wales and have made our mission to continue organizing good actions around the world so thanks so much for joining us Jamie um, welcome you're muted darling it's okay it was always going to happen to someone second don't time tonight oh, totally second fine. time tonight Sorry. Thank you, Jenny. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to be here. There's so many cool people on this panel. Some of you I know quite well, some not so well, but this is going to be really fantastic. Um, I'm super psyched to be here. So, yeah, basically, um, Women's March Sydney and March for Justice, we're the ones that keep asking you to come out and be angry on the streets with us, um, which has worked out tremendously well lately. Um, so I think, yeah, for, for us with those organisations, it's, it's been a lot of harnessing that energy that is out there in the community. Um, a lot of the time, lately, it seems like it's not actually us saying, hey, let's get out there and do this. It's the community saying, well, we're angry about this. We need to change this. We need to get out there, which is a, a lovely way to see the sort of paradigms of what's happening culturally shift. But um, yeah, unfortunately, like you said, you know, getting everybody out on the streets is one thing, but we don't want it to just be a moment in time. It's sort of doing the work from then on. So we're very focused on keeping up that energy, keeping the pressure on, uh, making sure that, you know, the people in power and the people who need to see it realise that we weren't just there on one day, we're not just going to go away. And, uh, yeah, we, we work under the HERS banner, which is Health, Economic Security, Representation and Safety. So, you know, just a, a small umbrella of things, not too much to deal with there. Um, a lot more, I would say, the safety these days. That's a big issue for us. Um, and at the moment, we're just trying to keep that pressure on, keep it in everybody's forefront of everybody's mind that this is an issue that's been going on for a while, but it's sort of hit a peak now. And we want to make sure that the initial actions turn into more meaningful action, um, particularly for us at the moment. We're very interested there's a federal budget coming out, how much of the, you know, there's been a lot of nice words and actions from a lot of the political sphere. We want to see how much that actually translates into dollars. Totally. Thanks so much, Jamie. I might actually introduce oh, two doctors um, together. So we have Dr. Amanda Conn, who's the chair of the Border Domestic Violence Network and the deputy mayor of Albury and a GP that works with victims and survivors of family violence and sexual assault. And also Dr. Karen Williams, who's a consultant psychiatrist and founder of Doctors Against Violence Towards Women and recently gave 
evidence at a parliamentary inquiry into coercive control that was very powerful. So welcome both Amanda and Karen. I might ask you to say a quick hello so then we can keep moving on to the questions. Thanks so much for having me, Jenny. It's so exciting to be joining you from Wiradjuri country here in Albury. Um, the Border Domestic Violence Network has been working on um, local responses and prevention of family violence. I think we've developed a pretty unique perspective on the difference um, in the ways that Victoria and New South Wales are dealing with this and the very real impact that that has on women's safety and to victim survivors. Um, I'm also really passionate about improving access to reproductive health services and particularly contraception and abortion in rural New South Wales. Thanks so much, Amanda. And Karen, welcome to you too. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, as you said, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm, I work mostly with people who have experienced trauma. And um, for women, that trauma normally happens within the family, either through family violence or sexual violence. Um, my advocacy started with just trying to highlight the, the different ways in which we respond to trauma in women and in men. And I, alongside Dr. Anita Hutchison, who's an excellent GP in Canberra, we, we founded Doctors Against Violence Towards Women, which is a, um, a group which is trying to highlight a lot of the issues that we face as medical professionals um, who are seeing women frontline and, and are un unable to access the resources that we need to help women in that position. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. And last but absolutely not least, um, Chanel Contos, who is the consent activist and founder of Teach Us Consent, who since February has managed to collect 40,000 signatures <coughs> and 6,000 testimonies calling for better consent education and holistic consent education in that time and has managed to get more ministers and more people chasing her on her Instagram account to try and have meetings with her than I think uh, anybody else has seen. So Chanel, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have a discussion with all these amazing um, people and be a part of this. Um, but yeah, I'm in London at the moment, which is a bit different and exciting. And I'm here studying a master's in gender, education and international development. So um, when I advocate for all this stuff, I'm not just making it up. I am <laughs> um, doing research to back it. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for the conversation. Thank you so much, Chanel. And I'd just like to acknowledge, I've just done a little scroll through and I just want to acknowledge that there are, while we have a, a high proportion of young women who are in this debate today, I just want to acknowledge that I can see that there are some older women that have been part of pushing feminist and women rights agenda for many, many years on this call. And I want to pay respect to you and thank you for all of the efforts and the things that you have done that have meant that we are now in the situation that we are in. And as I always like to remember the, the words of Wendy McCarthy when we finally decriminalised abortion in New South Wales, who said that that was unfinished business of our grandmothers. And I think that it is important for us to remember how long and hard sometimes these struggles are and that actually what we need to be doing is constantly respecting the elders of these movements and the pushers as well as recognizing and following the lead of young people who are stepping up to join and be part of this collective push for reform so thank you all and I acknowledge you too so I might Saxon if I can and Dania throw to you to first maybe Saxon and then Dania and just ask like what have you seen shifted and shift in your work and your advocacy in the past few months that is different to what you'd been seeing before and how things have done? What, what's the shift been like and, and how has it changed and how can we, how can we take that? Um, I think for me, I there are always sort of blips in the news where um, I will get a lot of media requests for, say, a week or so, um, you know, we'll decide we care about sexual violence again and then it, very quickly it goes away. Um, and I think the difference for me this time is that it has been really sustained. Um, you know, I've had a lot of requests, a lot of people actually willing to talk about it, which I think is really incredible. So I, I, I guess the main thing is that people 
are not just, um, you know, willing to listen for that news cycle. I think this is something that uh, hopefully uh, we'll see sustained. And I think a lot of times there's not a lot of votes that live and die in these issues. So politicians don't have to care about them, whether or not, you know, a lot of people will decide to not vote for this party or this party because of their views on sexual violence or their views on consent education or anything like that. Um, and I think that that in itself is shifting as well. So it does force the hand of a lot of politicians, perhaps not strongly enough on a federal level, but it does sometimes force the hand of politicians to have to have this conversation. Um, and when their answers aren't good enough, they do have to answer to that as well. Um, so it's been really good to sort of have this sustained momentum um, and I just hope it continues. Thanks so much, Saxon. Did you wanna jump in, Danya? Yeah, I think for me, um, sadly, I don't feel that enough has changed. I think particularly as um, a woman of colour and an advocate, I think that there are still um, enormous issues when it comes to visibility of women of colour voices. I think I've routinely noticed ever since I first told my story that I'm largely perceived as a spokesperson for white women, but not necessarily referred to or valued for my own individual contributions, the years of research that I've done since I've told my own story, um, nor is the trauma that I have experienced often really referred to or valued at all. Um, and it has been unusual and, and new for people to even cite that or refer to it, even though I first publicly told my story two years ago. So for me, sadly, it doesn't really feel like enough has changed. It feels as though I've had to do an enormous amount of work to get any validation or consideration for any of that work. Um, and I think a lot more needs to shift. I think the media needs to recognize its complicity in profiling white women. I think white women activists also need to note their own complicity in failing to ensure that a sufficient profile is lent to women of color and actively choosing to say, well, I'm not going to take that space. I'm gonna allow her for that space to be filled by women of color. So really, I think I can't say that much has changed because that's not what I've seen. But I can say that these things need to change and without active steps being taken by white women in this space um, to say, I'm going to take a step back to allow for more diverse voices to be included in this conversation. Unfortunately, little is going to change. Thanks so much, Danya. And I think the, the power of looking at all of these things and, the, and how it's positioned is just so clear when we see the kinds of response of different people in our community and the challenge around the idea of seeing not not intersectional politics as a or intersectional views as some like buzzword but actually what does that mean for us in our interactions it's one of the reasons just to say like obviously the women's march was incredible and i come to you erin and jamie and danny if i may just in terms of organizing big actions but one of the things that i just found so powerful of the organize of the action that danny and erin organized is it felt like they were living and breathing that connection between all of those things before they even started. Like you two, Danny and Erin, like you, you learned how to organize actions as student strikers, right? <laughs> you weren't organizing, you weren't organizing women's marches, you were, you were climate strikers. And I think to me, that's the shift of how does that all work and how do we connect? But do you want to talk Danny and Erin and then Jamie, maybe I'll come to you about like, how has it shifted your activism? Like how has it changed you as activists from what you were doing into this space and how did that shift for you? Yes, yeah, so I think for me, as you noted, I started as a climate activist. I helped organise Australia's largest environmental mobilisation when I was 15. And what we see now is that we have a lot more young people in these spaces, but also because of the work of the women before us, but also the incredible work of Chanel, we see that more students are actually coming out and we have the opportunity to speak out. But what I'd also like to raise is what Danya was talking about earlier. And I think the thing is, we've known this was an issue for a really, really long time, but as a student, as someone who was failed by the children's court, we're also seeing that the only reason we're really looking at how it's impacting young people and students specifically is because it was private school students who spoke out and were noticed. And it's not like the same culture 
doesn't also exist in public schools. If anything, it exists to the same extent, it's just with less privilege and with less money attached. So what's shifted for me really is nothing's changed in terms of what's happening. What we're seeing now is that absolutely nothing has changed. It's not getting worse. It's not getting better. We've just had more privileged people speaking up and therefore more people paying attention to it. Thanks so much, Danny. Before I throw to you, Erin, maybe I can come to Chanel on that point because I think it's really, it was a shift, right, in terms of noticing how you kind of started doing one thing because that was your experience and then broadened this out going, no, let's do it. Do you want to do you want to talk a, a bit more about that and how things kicked off and and then th those shifts that you would have witnessed and seen, right, which I imagine sometimes would have been criticisms and sometimes would have been inspiring boosts, right? Yes. Um, so I 100% agree with um, Danny and Danny. I think that, and I do think this a lot, like I quit my job to pursue this campaign and I'm so lucky I come from, um, you know, extreme privilege where that's possible for me to do. Otherwise, this wouldn't have been um, an option for my voice to have been so loud. Um, and I also um, acknowledge that rape culture is in every institution, every school institution, public, private, um, you know, it's not just schools and institutions. We know that it goes all the way from school kids up to parliament houses in every institution in Australia and worldwide. Um, my campaign started attacking the private school sector for two reasons. One, because it was my direct context and two, because I felt like I had power and leverage there. I never imagined that I would have any pull at a government level. And I felt that independent schools had the ability to work outside the curriculum and the resources um, to do this, which is why that was where my initial campaign started. But as soon as I realized that there was getting traction, I did expand um, to all schools around Australia, but I 100% agree it is a problem that you know, even though I'm a woman, the fact that I'm a white woman, the fact that I'm a rich woman has made all the difference in this. And that is so problematic um, for activism long term. Thanks so much, Chanel. Erin, I'll come back to you. Did you want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think, I mean, I've kind of self-identified as an activist since, well, a climate activist, at least since, since, since like year four. I mean, I lived on country. I saw my home burn down. Um, you know, I... Um, activism was kind of not really just like, like me deciding yeah I'm gonna be an activist it's like I need to be an activist I mean I, I have a voice and I've seen things and I need to I need to scream about them you know um and um I want to be a part of that change um I think when it comes to kind of like shifting from mostly mobilizing people for the climate um I think you know millions are disrupted by the abuse that is being perpetrated in the back rooms of Parliament House, but like I think what we need to be, what we need to acknowledge is that most of the crimes that affect everyday women um, are like a, a result of the of the abuse perpetrated on the parliamentary floor itself. You know, when when the government votes to withdraw JobKeeper and um, cut JobSeeker, you know that's going to keep women, in um, you know trap them pretty much and you know I think the I think I've always been about not alienating you know these issues from 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 each other you know um, whether it's refugee rights or justice or um, you know campaigning for you know to end violence against women and um, and you know even the climate I think you know we've all got to look at the common common denominator here and that is the government and its lack of action and it's kind of lack of you know genuine care for for people and for women and um, yeah for vulnerable people in the society so I think you know um, this has definitely been an amazing opportunity um, and it's and it's and it's it's you know with COVID as well um, organizing rallies has become a very difficult thing to do so um, this definitely this campaign has introduced me to a new way of organizing and also I get to organize with you know the best people ever and um, you know um, yeah so yeah back to you Jenny. Amazing thank you I, that was certainly a compliment for you I think Danny you can uh, take that one. Um, Jamie I mean you you've been part of Women's March, you were organising big Women's March stuff before, but like, how has it shifted? What, what do you think is the difference and what has Women's March seen in terms of the difference in the last few months? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the big differences is very much sort of getting back to the point that Erin was just making that, you know, she didn't become an activist because it was sort of an, an active choice. She became an activist because there was just things in her life and her experience that needed to be 
spoken out about. And I think that's a big part of it. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. You know, that saying the personal is the political. And I think what's shifted so much in these last few months is that with the absolute barrage of stories that have come out, none of which are new, none of this behaviour is new, none of these experiences are new. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us here have been talking about this for a while. It's not that it's become worse or it's become more public. It's I think it's that people are more willing to speak about their experiences and reflect on where those experiences that they're seeing in the media are maybe hitting home personally. I mean, it's it goes without saying that just about every woman can relate to a feeling of, of not feeling safe or, you know, feeling underrepresented or that they're not being taken seriously or believed and that there are people in positions of power that are not taking their trauma seriously. And obviously that's that's one thing for us to say is, that, you know, me personally as, you know, a, a white woman, but it's an entirely different thing to then say, well, how is that then reflected through the experiences of, you know, women of colour, First Nations women, um, other communities? And I think what's really shifted in the last few months with that is, number one, that people are willing to recognise the universality of that experience, although it's different for everybody, but just that common feeling of we know what it's like and we can't continue on like this. And then I think the other thing is just the we seem a little more willing now as a community and we still have a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but we seem a lot more willing as a community to just not accept it as the status quo anymore, not accept it as this is just the way things are. Um, you know, even in the last couple of weeks with the the consent app, for example, and that the, the milkshake video, um, I heard a couple of people say, you know, well, that's good because at least they're having, at least it's starting a dialogue about it. But then what I was really glad to hear was the pushback from people saying, oh, no, 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 we've been talking about this for a while. So let's listen to the people who've been talking about this for a while. It's not enough anymore to just say, oh, well, we've opened up a dialogue and that's not. Totally. Like, don't start it from scratch, right? Yeah. This is not a start yeah. from scratch thing. This is like yeah. a, there are people that know how to do this. Yeah, that's what's encouraging. I think people are more willing now to go, oh, no, we're not content to just go, well, we've started a conversation about it, so that's a good point, and we'll just leave it there and, you know, continue on our slow path. People are going, no, no, let's deal with this now. Yeah, for sure. And Karen and Amanda, like, how have you found the last few months and the focus on these issues impacting the work that you do? Like, how has is, how is it shifted in terms of, in terms of your work and the, and, the, and the support you're giving, but also the, the advocacy that you're engaging in? Karen, did you want to respond first it's so awkward to say Karen did you respond first because I can't like signal at anyone because we're not in a real panel anyway apologies for that everyone for the awkwardness of the zoom emceeing Karen did you want to um kick that yeah, off sure um I think for for me um you know working in the front lines with women that are, have survived trauma um you know I've, it's so clear how it is the psychological scars that come from abuse and, and sexual trauma, family violence that are the most painful. And we know that, um, you know, survivors are made to feel like they're crazy. I mean, that's why they end up with me. Um, they are made to feel that it's all their fault. They're made to feel that they are shameful and that they are worthless. Um, so over time, though, I've, I've seen how we as a society replicate those injuries and in how we respond to um, trauma and violence in women. And in, in that I mean as in how as medical professionals, we may not respond by um, appropriately by, by recognising how violence has brought the woman to us. Um, we don't even ask about it a lot of the time um, and how, you know, we replicate those injuries within our police system when we don't believe women and we accuse them of lying and having an agenda for making um, coming forward when at the same time we're going to blame them and get it out for coming forward and for staying in those relationships um, with court systems that that make women believe uh, make them out to be liars and trying to punish their partners, all of these um, systems that are set up to to repeat the abuse that these women have already experienced in their homes, and having spoken out about it, you know a little bit, I become much more compelled to to speak out more loudly than ever before because I mean I'm, I'm feeling that 
people are feeling validated by that and I have the capacity to do that. I'm not in danger if I come out and, and speak out against the systems that hurt women and I feel that I, I have an obligation, I suppose, to, to call it out because I can. Absolutely. Thank you. Amanda, how are you finding it in Aubrey? Um, people are talking about this. We have firmly put this issue on the agenda. It's been talked about for decades by certain groups of people, but not potentially by society at large. And I think that was really obvious here in Aubrey. This is a conservative regional town and we had a March for Justice where 400 people turned up with about a day's notice. Um, and loads of those people were um, people who'd never been to an action before. So I think there is a real mood for change, but that's um, potentially had some unintended negative consequences and um, it shows the need for a lot more action as well. So when I talk about unintended negatives, um, I think um, this kind of encouragement of people to come out with their stories is, is really important and really cathartic and we want to encourage people to seek support. Um, but that's um, been triggering for a lot of people potentially, um, seeing um, sexual assault on the news day after day after day for survivors of a sexual assault has been really difficult. Certainly a lot of my patients with um, PTSD have, have been triggered by what's happening around them. Um, and it's pushing service providers to absolute capacity. Um, you know, we experience some vicarious trauma and burnout ourselves, um, and um, particularly in rural areas where services were at capacity probably to begin with, um, it's really showing the limitations we have to support people. And I think that that just points to all of more work we need to do. Um, you know, as a particular example, I spent all afternoon making phone calls to um, all the connections I've got locally with service providers for someone who desperately needed emergency housing um, because she was unsafe to leave my office that afternoon. And there wasn't any, there was not, it was all full. She was gonna be waiting weeks for emergency housing. That's not emergency. Um, and I think um, similarly to Karen, you know, I feel really obliged to talk about these things, particularly in a regional community where people don't have anonymity or confidentiality to be able to speak publicly. Um, a lot of the victim survivors that I work with don't feel safe to come out publicly because they live in a small town when you know, their perpetrator's family um, are still here. So I feel really obliged to, to tell those stories on behalf of the people that don't feel safe to yet. Totally. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. And I think it goes to Erin's point as well, the, the connection between decisions around government decisions around funding and other things on issues of housing or job seeker. We know, you know, recently I was interacting with a number of women who um, had experienced domestic violence, but then were trying to live on job seeker in public housing and were being re-traumatized regularly because of the levels of aggression and violence where they were living. But that is their only option. Like I think all of these things are are intersected together. So I'm going to move to the next bit and I'm going to ask all of our panelists to, to give me basically your list, right? So if we are setting the agenda, then in my world, if you want to get things changed and done, you need to have a to-do list of what needs to change. And so I am going to ask, we, we can take notes, Lydia and Caitlin, who are working in the Newtown electorate office with me, will be taking notes. And I think this will be our collective to-do list that then we can share around. Everyone on the call thinks that they were just here to listen, but actually they are now part of the mission to uh, deliver on this collective to-do list so we achieve it. So this is the challenge. If we were writing a collective to-do list of what we need to achieve and prioritize this year, I mean, I'm just putting it out there, like, but maybe the stuff that we would strike for as women until these demands were met, because we are powerful. Like we have shown there is a fear currently because of the fact that there is a there is a very big movement of people no longer playing silent on this. And that is growing. So if we have a to-do list, what's at the top of the to-do list for you? I'm going to go to you, Erin and Danny, and then I'll come to you, Amanda, and then I'll keep moving through. Erin, you get the first. What is what is on the to-do list? Um, all right. Um, I think probably Danny will have a similar thing. Um, but I would say my to-do list is um, sort of kind of a, around our demands for our rally, you know, funding into domestic violence services. Um, you know, like, as you were saying, you know, women are, are being trapped and re-traumatized on the daily by 
things that our government could literally, you know, we had job keeper and we had job seeker and, and that actually gave women freedom, you know, children, um, women with children were able to actually afford to look after those kids without having to be with their abusive partners. So I think definitely on my to-do list, top of the list would um, 100% be, you know, refunding 1-800-RESPECT and, you know, those services that are so crucial to women in our society, for sure. Thanks. So right, your turn. Dan Danny, do you want to jump in with the rest of the demands? Yep. You so, guys have got it easy, right? That's why I came to you first, because you've got a rally coming up. You've got the demands listed. Go for it, Danny. Yes. Yeah, so my first thing is hopefully you guys will join us at Town Hall May 8th to really push for these demands. But firstly, we want sexist politicians out of Parliament. I don't think I need to elaborate because I think you guys know who I'm talking about. Secondly, we want legal and economic support for survivors. And what that looks like is properly funding rape crisis and domestic and women services. It's renationalizing 1800 Respect. We want economic safety for women. We want people living above the poverty line and we want no more attacks on casual workers. And then fourthly, we need expanded education around sex consent and sexism in schools because what we're seeing right now is that the people who exist to protect us are failing us and we're not doing this despite the fact we're young we're doing this because we're young and because we've never been able to vote so those are our four key demands and I'll write them down in the chat but that's what we want to see as young people do it we can start actually a fair call put them in the chat so then we've got the to-do list there everyone knows they're walking away with a serious mission they're focused amanda do you want to add to that to-do list um yes please and jenny there's heaps of people chiming in in the chat with their own items Amazing. To add, okay so we've got a lot to capture. You know, that's always the challenge there's never there's never a shortage but just to say before you jump in amanda the other thing is also key is that a lot of these things are solvable these are not unsolvable problems, right? And so part of it is like it feels big in terms of the list of things that need to happen, but they're also like in most cases quite easy to solve. You know, it's just about choices. It's about priorities and it's about how much we want to put women's safety and women's res respect for women front and centre in the decisions that are made by the powers that be. But go for it, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Um, look, this is the most exciting part of the evening for me because having put all of this on the agenda and started this conversation, there is no point unless we get change happening. Um, I could talk for the whole hour and a half about things that I think need to be done, but I tried to narrow it down to four for you, Jenny. <laughs> um, so um, the first one is we need all young people to get comprehensive sex ed in schools that includes um, consent education. Um, there's really good academic research to show that young people really want to know what's normal. Um, and they're going to find that out if the information isn't provided to them. They're going to look for it online. They're going to look for it from their peers or from porn. Um, so we need to get that right. And I won't talk anymore about that because I think Chanel will probably cover that for me. Um, we absolutely need better access to reproductive health care, um, contraception and abortion. We legalised abortion in New South Wales a couple of years ago. Thanks for your help with that, Jenny. Um, but there's, there's no access um, for um, women in really low socio socioeconomic groups, um, particularly women in rural areas, women with a disability, um, women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. There's a lot more work to be done there. Um, we need coercive control to be criminalised, and I know that there's some work happening in New South Wales on that, which is really, really exciting. Um, that really should be nationwide or at least harmonised with other states. I'm pretty anxious about what will happen to my patients who might live in Victoria and work in New South Wales or vice versa, um, if that only happens in, in one state at a time. Um, finally, and I, and I think we'll all agree about this one, um, we need women everywhere that decisions are being made. Um, and as someone that's quite passionate about local action, we've got local government elections in New South Wales in September. And there are incredible women in every local community in New South Wales who deserve to be making decisions in local government and we can get them elected. And we need to particularly support those women who come from um, backgrounds of, of intersectional disadvantage. Um, you know, we've talked about the intersection of, of gender and race tonight, but I'm particularly thinking of trans women and, and um, um, in other women from LGBTQIA plus um, backgrounds, um, non-binary people um, and people with a disability as well. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. And just the mention of trans women, just to say um, the panellists have put in, we've put in those of us that can change our names, our pronouns in the chat. I just want to acknowledge that this is an inclusive and welcoming 
event and it's welcome to all people who want to join this event and you know for me in a world where we have to make sure that we can't see racism in our feminist campaigns we also can't see transphobia in our feminist campaigns and I think we need to acknowledge and recognize that. Um, Dania I'm going to come to you with your list next and then Saxon I'll throw to you. Oh gosh, my list is long. Um, <laughs> Be aware of the time. We're ready. I know. Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> sorry. You All know right, how sorry. long my list is, but I'm Even trying. List. Just talk really quickly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First, I think reforms of the criminal justice system in terms of sexual violence cases, um, in particular, I think reforms that are very important uh, revolve around the police. We need to stop telling survivors to go to the police until the police have been reformed. Um, it is an extraordinarily re-traumatizing experience when there is absolutely no consistent training or really any adequate training to speak of um, when it comes to how to speak to survivors. And it is incredibly important to ensure due to the nature of memory and trauma that police are trained to do that properly, understand how to forensically gather evidence, particularly in sexual violence cases, um, and that we completely change how the DPP perceives which cases should be heard because there's obviously an, an enormous problem with that. Um, I think going beyond that as well, we need reforms of evidence law um, and new jury directions and things like that on sexual violence because those are broken um, and result in low conviction rates that are unacceptable. Second, I think that there needs to be an innovation of alternative justice responses. I don't think that the criminal justice system is appropriate in each and every case. I think there are particular things that women will want um, that you know, they can seek through another forum that doesn't need to be through the criminal justice system. I think we should accept that the justice system can provide different types of responses and ensure those forums are available. Um, third, I think that this civil sexual discrimination offences jurisdiction should be created as a no-cost jurisdiction because currently it's extraordinarily difficult to bring a claim when often, you know, or basically all the time, there's a power imbalance, right? Like you've had your autonomy and body violated by somebody in a position of greater power why on earth should you be expected to face the potential in a stacked system of bankruptcy as a result of standing up for your legal rights? I think we need to make it a no-cost jurisdiction and ensure that to the extent any costs are imposed, that they recognise the financial limitations and ongoing discrimination and gender and pay inequity that women face in society. Um, and I think beyond consent education, we need to actually educate all boys and men, all of them across the board, I don't care what age, they all need to have ongoing education on how to have healthy relationships on gender, on their own power, on their own entitlement, on their unconscious sexism. It's not a question of if you are manifesting those behaviours, it's a question of how. And I think that it needs to be mandated across the board because if there is an assessment that somebody is of high risk, there needs to be an intervention program developed to ensure that those behaviours are proactively dealt with, rather than forcing the burden onto women when they're unsafe to deal with these things alone, when the entire point of their abuse is to stop them from feeling comfortable doing that. Um, and I think finally, um, and I'm sure Karen will speak more to this, but I think that we need to ensure the health of survivors is taken care of. I think there needs to be Medicare reform to ensure that the costs of seeing a psychiatrist are far lower because it's very difficult for people to actually see a doctor. Um, and I mean, even in terms of psychologists entitlements, you know, you've only got the 10 sessions, that's not good enough. Um, how is that meant to be enough in complex cases? So I think we need to overhaul how we fund these things and provide provisions for there to be um, free uninhibited access to mental health care um, for those who are experiencing sexual or domestic violence. And I also think we kind of need, you know, the National Trauma Recovery Centre that Karen's been um, instrumental in leading the push for, so that, you know, women actually have the access to medical care that veterans have. You know, it's sad feeling envious of the access that veterans have to care for PTSD, but that's how I felt. Um, and, you know, all women deserve to, to feel like they're always going to be able to access what they need at any time. Um, and I think as a part of that, we need to start incentivizing mental health professionals to have clear trauma-informed training because a lot of mental health professionals aren't trained in that way and it can lead to women sort of cycling through the system. Um, 
but that is the cold version, which was, oh my gosh. so I'm so sorry. My list is just kind of endless, but I'm going to stop there. List, Tanya. That is an amazing list. I feel like the, um, that is a list of someone that has like clearly been thinking about this for a long time, <laughs> been living this and is, should be leading the way in terms of the kinds of reforms we needed around it. There were like high levels of nods happening as I was scrolling <laughs> through, having a look. Um, that is a good list. Um, Saxon, do you want to add to that list? You want to you want to take some priorities out of those lists that we've got so far? No, I mean what's left? <laughs> we've said it all. No, but this is why I don't think I could ever you, be a politician. You can answer the question and uh, how do we do that in the next? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that for another chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think this is why I could never be a politician because I think you know you start on this role of like well, this is equally as important as this and as obvious to me as all of the other things. So when do I stop, you know, putting things on this to-do list? Um, I mean, like we have all said and we have said for many years, but specifically the last few weeks, um, relationship and sexuality education um, is definitely a must. Um, it's not the be all end all of our, our problems, but I think, you know, that is some way and, uh, you know, starting from a very, very young age, um, you know, like preschool, early um, primary school education, uh, age appropriate relationship and sexuality education is just necessary there is no other alternative um but I mean how how many other things can I put on here without <laughs> straight can, can I ask you Saxon to talk specifically around consent reform like what yeah, is on absolutely. that to-do list well I think uh New South Wales needs to um just bite the bullet and actually legislate for affirmative consent or enthusiastic consent. Um, they have sort of tiptoed around it in their recommendations. Um, I don't know if they're tabling the bill, but if they are in its current form, it is not affirmative consent. It is not enthusiastic consent. Um, and, you know, we, we do have that in Australia. It is not Victoria. Victoria does not have enthusiastic consent, but Tasmania does. It's had it for about 15 years. And, uh, you know, having this, this example of this law working that we seem to struggle so deeply with, you know, agreeing on whether or not it's a good idea or whether or not it puts too much onus. It's not some far off, you know, it's not Canada that has done this. There is a state in Australia that's had this for over 15 years and it's worked. So we need to just push it and actually commit to affirmative consent legislation in I mean, all around Australia, but New South Wales is so close. Um, it would be such a waste to get that close to that finish line and just and just leave it there without actually legislating for that. Because I think, you know, even though obviously not all survivors go through the court system, it's not a choice for everybody. It's not the path for everybody. Um, and so there is this idea that, oh, well, it's just, you know, this law. No one really thinks, I don't know what the laws are about other things, so why would I know about that? But it is this trickle-down system. A police officer might decide, oh, your case isn't worth it because from what I know, it won't go through anyway. So they won't treat you with that dignity, with that respect of, okay, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you do this. So it does have those trickle-downs sort of effects um but yeah I, I think obviously we're very close to being able to legislate for affirmative consent if we could do that that would be cool and I can say just on that like you know I I've given notice of a bill around enthusiastic consent but I have also explicitly said to the Attorney General of New South Wales I'd be much happier if he just wants to use all of his resources of being the Attorney General to draft that himself and implement enthusiastic consent and very happily support it if that's what he does so you let's see where we're, right. we're back in Parliament I don't see him in the in the chat. I don't, I don't know if it's yeah. I've just scrolled through, <laughs> but I'm not sure if uh, the attorney is here. We're back in Parliament next week. Maybe I'll send him the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to jump in, Chanel, on your to-do list, which I imagine is probably growing longer than what you initially thought it was going to be when you started engaging in the space? Oops, I was on mute. Um, it is. It is growing longer. I'll um, narrow it down to three things. So firstly, education reform. We've spoken about that a lot. We get it. We know that that's a pinnacle, like it's, it's a catalyst of cultural change and that's why we need it. Um, second, legislative reform. I agree. We need enthusiastic consent and we also need to go beyond that and make it so if someone is playing that they didn't know um, that, you know, if, it, if it's objective like how am I saying this if the victim has objectively been raped but the perpetrator is denying that they knew they were raping the victim then 
we need to make it so that they have to prove that they took active steps to gain enthusiastic consent in order for them to be able to get off um, with reasonable doubt. And then secondly, I think the problem that most people don't report their sexual assault cases is because we have this idea in society of a rapist being someone who hurts you, who attacks you, who um, you know, is very malicious and violent. And the problem is that the vast majority of rape cases are with people that you know and trust and are potentially sexually active within other ways. The problem here is that, again, our legislative system, we send people to jail to rehabilitate so that they can then socialize in society again. However, the type of rapist that is making up the vast majority of sexual assault cases, they don't always need jail rehabilitation. They need empathy training. They need healthy masculinities training. They need to be held accountable for their actions. But most victims are not willing to take them through the court system for multiple reasons. So we need a new legislation. We need a new criminal conviction that is kind of like a lesser sentence for this type of rapist who's not a sadistic serial killer, but is still a criminal. And I think that that would be absolutely game changing um, in encouraging people to report the same way that there's a different sentence if you're a drug dealer or if you're um, caught with a certain amount of something. Um, there needs to be a scale that would be that would encourage people to report it would see justice through the system and it would create a better society as a whole and hold people accountable for this vast, like widespread rape culture that is people we know and trust and who appear to be normal and nice people in all other aspects of life, except when their um, sexual desires um, outrule the feelings of the person in front of them. Um, and then we also need our legislative system to account for the fact that it is a normal trauma response for a girl to not only freeze in the moment, but to then, um, be nice and appease their oppressor afterwards and in the act. It needs to be accounted for so that there can't be questions saying, you know, why did you let him drive you home? Or um, why did you get breakfast with him the next week? We, we need to make it so that the actions that happen before and after are irrelevant and that fawning is recognized as a trauma response. And then thirdly, we need resource allocation. Um, as Amanda touched on before, the um, system is being pushed to capacity. It's because our society would, there would literally be an apocalypse if we suddenly found out how many people had been raped and how many people we know were rapists. And if everyone seeks help at once, if everyone went through the court system at once, it would be chaos. In the UK, after the Me Too movement, there was massive rises in the number of reporting um, of sexual assault. However, absolute numbers, as in like the amount of people actually convicted went down because the system was so overpowered that it only took through those sadistic types of rapists that were guaranteed to get convictions. And no one was advocating um, for you know, the people who deserve just as much justice and accountability, but it's more of a, in the court system, a gray area case um, that takes longer, that's you know, more evidence is required, especially with technology and if these people know each other previously and after. Um, and we also need resource allocation into training on how to deliver this educational reform content. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot yeah, more. You know, that's about it's it just a few small things to add in the mix, Chanel, in addition to what you were originally demanding for. I like it. I think it also shows as you as people are engaging and connecting, it's like what seems like, okay, over here I've got a solution is we see all the other bits that connect in and intersect, which is why it's so important for those people that are making decisions to listen to people with lived experience, but also listen to experts that have been doing this for a very, very long time. Jamie and Karen, have you got anything to add to these growing to-do lists that we've got on, uh, on the table? Uh, I mean, all of the above, obviously. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, the, one of the major ones that I think is definitely uh, resource allocation, it's additional funding. Um, frontline services are, you know, we've heard a little bit about it from Amanda tonight. You can hear about it from any, anybody who works in a frontline service you talk to. They're underfunded, they're at capacity. Um, the resources are there, they're just not being allocated appropriately. Um, you know, within New South Wales in particular, there's been plenty of studies done there's been plenty of reports issued um, that's part of the problem we're hearing from a lot of frontline organizations they don't want to go through another review they don't want to have another independent panel convened they don't want to have another summit 
those have all been done before. They've done well, the can work. Can I just interrupt to say if someone yeah. offers another inquiry, I'm just like, I'm done. Like we've got yeah. the recommendations, we've got the solutions. Could we just resource the actual implementation of those things? I don't want another in The only inquiry I'm keen for is one that is actually like a truth and reconciliation commission that allows people to, survivors, to put their stories on the record so people can see just how crap the system has been to them. But that is only if they want to do that, to have their story recorded and heard and listened to. Otherwise, no more inquiries. I'm done. I know that's a controversial thing from an MP, but I'm just like over it. (laughs) Anyway, Jamie, sorry no. to interrupt. Keep no, going. no, you're totally right. Um, yeah. It's, uh, and, I mean, this is the other thing, right? Our The New South Wales Attorney General also happens to be our Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. So we're not even asking for two separate people to do the work here. It's one guy. So he has all of the information. He has the ability to do it. Let's just do it. Um, so, yeah, New South Wales specifically, more funding. Um, the New South Wales Women's Alliance, they've, been working with a you know uh, this safe safe state sorry campaign for a long time they have a very long list of recommendations for very specific policy recommendations and funding that needs to be allocated that's for you know that's for emergency shelter that's for um that's for funding for victim services that's for things like men's behavior change programs which are also important if we're talking about you know doing it from a cultural level then we also need to fund these organizations that are working in that space to try to rehabilitate perpetrators and try to you know change these attitudes that enable this sort of behavior so funding 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 um we have the money let's spend it and on the flip side of that there's been so many reports that have been done and I think the figure that keeps coming out with New South Wales is that it costs our state around about six billion dollars a year in family and domestic violence that's the highest in the country. That is not like a record to be proud of. That's something that we should be ashamed of. And that's something that we should be working on. If it's costing us that much money, then why is it not being funded proportionally? If there were other issues happening in the state that were costing us that much money, if there were other dangers and you know threats to safety that were costing us this much money, they would be funded appropriately. So number one is definitely the money and allocating the money to the places that it needs to go. So listening to the frontline services that know exactly where the money needs to go and know what the work is. Um, Another thing, without trying to touch too much on what other people are saying, um, because obviously legal reform, um, affirmative consent, definitely there needs to be, you know, our, our family court reform. That's a, could go into that. That's a whole nother thing, but um, you know, (laughs) Funding for the family court, I think it's in New South Wales at the moment, I think the figure is about $40,000 if someone wanted to pay privately for an independent assessment if they were going through family court. I don't know that many people who could afford that. Um, I shudder to think that people think that that's what they need to spend to get an independent assessment if they're trying to prove that maybe there's, you know, there's a history of violence or behaviour that's not safe for themselves and their families. But this is where it's at because we're just not allocating the resources properly again and and trying to make it this single entry point which everybody with the experience is saying doesn't work um so i went off on a bit of a tangent there even though i said i wasn't going to um and then finally just quickly i think it's for us the big thing is that there needs to be a cultural acceptance of the fact that the reason why women's safety and family and domestic violence and and sexual violence is such an issue is because as a culture we accept it as being a part of being a woman in society and that cannot be acceptable anymore a lot of people are already saying that that's not acceptable a lot of people have been for a while but that's something that as a society we need to reckon with the fact that there is still so much blaming of victims so much questioning of survivors um why is our first instinct to try to pick apart these stories and try to find a reason why we shouldn't believe someone's story instead of believing their story and then working from that and figuring out how we can support that person. That's something that goes to all of us. Um, It's a, uh, you know, it's a massive cultural issue. It's not something that I have an easy solution for, but the fact remains that the reason why it is such a huge problem, it's, it's a crisis in our country, And we are talking about it, but we're not talking about it enough. And we're not talking about the fact that culturally, 
we're not doing enough to stop it. We need to be calling out behavior before it gets to the point of, you know, a sexual assault. Obviously, we all know that's bad. Totally. Is there enough happening in society where we're calling out these attitudes of just misogyny or anything basically that leads to it being seen as acceptable? Totally. And I think that's a whole new, that's a whole new world as well, right? In terms of how we call that out. Karen, I need you to add to this to-do list to finalize it. Like, what are you going to add to it? Um, Where are we at in terms of your to-do list or priorities? Oh, you're muted, darling. My to-do list is about three years long. Um, All right, amazing. Maybe just give it a top line. But but as Dania said, she talked about trauma and and how, you know, the the response that we we have or the lack of response we have for trauma in women, we have a real understanding, I think, within our society that our veterans come back from from a deployment and they are traumatised and they they sometimes disabled for a long time, that they are unable to work, that they get pensions, that they are not expected to do the kinds of things that other people have to do. Whereas with women who are traumatised, they are still expected to attend Centrelink, they're expected to provide reasons for why they're not able to do the things that they, you know, would be expected of them. Their, their injuries are not seen or not accounted for. They're not given any kind of visibility within our health system and within our social services system. So I really want to see that change. And I think that's quick and easy. I I can't see why we need any more evidence at all to prove that women are traumatized by near-death experiences because we already know this stuff. So why are we not doing anything about it? So that's what I want to see done first. The next thing I want to see is, well, you know, as we've talked about already with the coercive control laws, this is really important because we are not actually, we don't criminalize domestic violence. Criminalizing one push or shove is not actually addressing domestic violence in any real way. The the damaging behaviors that keep women in those relationships, the isolation, the humiliation, the degradation, keep taking away all supports of finances from women that keep women in those positions and then a family law court that will attack a woman who tries to leave those situations. I think that has to stop and we need to actually be implementing all of the recommendations that come from these inquiries instead of calling for more inquiries. We know exactly what the problems are. Start implementing those recommendations and do it now and stop delaying. I just cannot understand why we continually have to have these discussions. We have to review the police response to domestic violence and the sentencing around that sentencing is ridiculous it's it's not it it is a joke when about one percent of our uh, perpetrators are even completing their sentences and those are the ones that are guilty so I want to see a change to that I want to see um, a review of the family court report writers who are completely unregulated and writing reports on entire families after meeting them for 40 minutes and making huge dangerous decisions without any kind of accountability Speaking about accountability, our politicians need to be accountable for everything. I'm not trying to cut you in at the bit where you're about to tell the politicians what to do, but Karen, I need you to wrap because I want to go to the final question. Okay. But you keep going. Tell us about politicians. I don't want to look like I'm trying to protect myself. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I completely understand. But all budgetary decisions that need to, they, I think um, politicians need to have provided evidence base for why they're making those decisions. And there should be transparency about where they're spending their money and, and account for, or well, show some sort of level of improvement after every decision that they make. And if they keep making bad decisions, they should get booted like the rest of us do. That's it. <laughs> 100%. I agree with that last point, full on. Um, now, I have got the chance to be able to ask you all First of all, let me just say that to-do list is slightly overwhelming. Uh, if you are feeling slightly overwhelmed by this size and scale of what needs to be done, um, can I let you know a few things? The first thing is to say that the reason why it is so overwhelming is in part because people know that there is a connection between all of the different parts of our society and systems that can either support and work to help people that have experienced sexual violence, to help people um, that are going through issues of bullying and harassment and assault to, and to educate people to prevent all of this from happening or there's a whole lot of shit that you could do that actually will just make it worse or ignore the problem so the reason why the list is so big is because we all get on this panel and I would imagine many people on this call the connection between all of those things and how it plays out for people in the lives and their experiences that they have realistically 
it's a pretty simple to-do list that at the top has that we need to treat women with respect and we need to make sure that people are not assaulted or harassed or intimidated or bullied. And if they are, that they are supported in getting justice. All of those bits are the answers within that. That to-do list is huge. We have got some time to be able to work on that to-do list. I'm telling you that this group of uh, women on this call and all of you who have joined are now part of delivering on that to-do list. People have been doing it already. Some people on this call have been doing this for bloody decades. Others people have been doing it for a few months. But together, I feel like we are on track to be able to deliver on this. And this is part of keeping up the momentum. So before we end, and I promised that we were going to end at 7.30. So I want to say, I'm really sorry. If we're in a normal world and we weren't all on Zoom, we'd have time for questions and chat and coffee afterwards. I'm really sorry to all of you who have joined the call and don't get to have your say and be part of the conversation, but there's currently, you know, a, over 100 people on the Zoom. And if we did that, we would literally be here for another five hours. So I'm sorry that you don't get to ask your own questions, but I'm going to go to all of our panelists who I'm going to ask you if you can to be quite short and succinct. And I want to ask you this. I want to ask you what gives you hope that we are going to achieve this? What is the thing that makes you turn around and go, okay, instead of just feeling shit and despairing about it, what gives you hope to actually feel like we're going to achieve some of this change? Because I can say for me, what gives me hope is all of you. Because I know that you are on a mission and my job is to just try and keep up and to try and amplify wherever I can your solutions and your answers and your activism and your mobilization. That gives me hope. I would love to hear what gives you hope. Um, maybe I'll come to you first, Jamie. Oh, you're mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Jamie's muted while she's hope. Oh, oh there darling. we go. There hope we go. again. Come on. What gives, what <laughs> um, gives you hope, Jamie? Yeah, see, uh, seeing all of these discussions happening gives me hope. Seeing the amount of people who are willing to give up their time and their energy to be a part of it, whether it is, you know, attending a march or signing a petition or being on a Zoom call or anything like that, you know, speaking personally, we asked people to come out on a Monday day at the March for Justice and thought, well, that's a little bit ridiculous. And then... I stepped outside at one point and actually realised how many people were there and went, oh, my goodness, this is how many people actually think this is a problem that needs addressing and are willing to be out there. And it's not just that. It's the fact that, you know, since that day, people have been at us constantly saying, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's going on, what are we doing now? <laughs> and that's a great thing. I mean, we're all tired, but that's a great thing because it can't just stop now. So what gives me hope is the fact that people aren't just willing to let us, ourselves, our politicians, our, our police, our legal system, everyone, we're not willing to let us off the hook and go, well, we had a rally about it. So I guess that's done. It's the fact really? that there's more to come and there is more to come. Yeah. Chanel, Karen, what gives you hope? Chanel first. Um, I would say two things. So first thing, I was speaking to Elizabeth Boderick the other day, who works in a specialist role for discrimination against girls and women in the UN. And she said to me that the best thing about being a woman fighting for change in the world is the fact that there are literally millions of others doing the exact same thing. And I think that's so nice because altogether we will get somewhere. Um, and the second thing is every single time like I got messages yesterday that an 80 year old woman spoke about um, her sexual assault experience for the first time and came forward and every time I see someone like that someone who's been so shamed their whole life into that um, speak out and be willing to change the culture and change the conversation I get a lot of hope. Thank so much for that Karen. <laughs> um, for me definitely the the thing that gives me hope is Nothing, nothing to do with activism, really. It's my experiences with my patients, the women who have undergone such incredible lives that, I, you know, that most of us can never imagine. And when I work in, with those women and, uh, and actually deal with the trauma that they've experienced, and I'm always blown away by how 
much better that they get um, when you actually validate their, their experience and you, you actually um, highlight for them how unjust the entire system has been for them and how they come back fighting themselves and want to want to join in 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 this same battle so I they are the ones that that make me feel hopeful that it's this whole thing is worth it because it's not actually that difficult to to cause a huge big change and improve the lives of people that's what gives me hope thank you so much Karen Dania Amanda what gives you hope Dania um, I think the sacrifice that women are so willing to make, I mean, I think what gives me hope is fundamentally that every person that I've kind of spoken to and come across in this space has felt that their activism is not a choice. It is like a calling and a fundamental part of who they are. And the power of that on a mass scale is, you know, absolutely enormous. I mean, I think as well, the capacity to come together with with people regardless of political persuasion age or other difference i mean in particular like jenny you've been such a great resource and help to me and i think you know a lot of people never really look at politics in that way but i think it is so important and so amazing to be able to form those kinds of healthy relationships under the auspices of like diversity and feminism where that basically happens nowhere else in terms of politics where it can be so polemical to have that opportunity has been really wonderful and i think you know, what also gives me hope is, I suppose, you know, knowing that I'm not going to stop working to make Kate proud and to kind of create a positive legacy for her. And, um, you know, she taught me so much and I've just really loved the opportunity to be able to work um, in this space and, and learn from diverse women. I mean, and like Chanel, I've also, you know, like left full-time work to focus on this advocacy. And I think those kinds of decisions, pouring ourselves into that work, shows that we're not going anywhere and we're not going to give up on it. And that's kind of what gives me hope seeing, you know, other women doing that same thing and having that like fierce passion and drive. Thank you so much, Dania. Amanda? Um, I'm really inspired by hearing about all of the work that's happening across so many different sectors where women have been chipping away for so long. You know, all of my work's been in health and local government, and we've heard tonight about the legal sector, about police reform, about reform in the education um, sector. And I think there's actually a lot happening when you when you talk about it all in one night. It's so important that we're organising and that we can all get together and have this conversation that's, you know, multidisciplinary, um, which is really exciting. And the second thing that really gives me hope is young people. I cannot believe how incredible the school students are in organising. Um, you know, I couldn't countenance that um, when I was their age. And um, it just gives me so much hope for the future because they'll be in charge soon and they know what they're doing. Absolutely. I think I get the sense that they're already in charge, just saying we just haven't we just haven't seeded, seen the uh, the seeding of power. But I think they're already running the show is my is my hope. And I'm pleased by that. Um, Erin, did you want to jump in and then I'll go to you, Danny, and then Saxon. What gives you hope, Erin? Um, I think, oh, this is such a it's, it's a question that really does make you your heart hurt a little bit. Well, um, I think. I think what gives me hope is not, you know, parliament, not the judicial system, um, you know, not, not kind of, yeah, changes within those kinds of things. But what gives me hope is you guys. What gives me hope is seeing thousands of angry women at the March for Justice rally, you know, seeing, seeing just anger and frustration and seeing women who are just saying, hey, no, nah, that's it. No more. Um, there's we don't deserve this and we deserve so much better and we deserve so many opportunities and we deserve to be heard. And those are the people that do give me hope. Um, and yeah, and I, what also gives me hope is knowing that as many other people here have said that we're not gonna give up. Um, we, we can't give up. It's, um, it would go against everything we believe. And um, yeah, and I, I want you to know everyone here that um, I want you guys to consider yourself activists. I want you guys to consider yourself change makers because it's you guys, it's the people on the streets. It's the angry, like, you know, you look at other movements and other serious change, changes in our society and that has come from mass movements, mass mobilizations. And I, and we need the mass to do that. So I think it's, you know, really important um, to appeal to, appeal to those people and um, yeah, and I'm very, very excited to work with all of you guys and you guys do truly do give me hope. 
I think the feeling is mutual, Erin. We are very, very excited that you are part of the movement that is going to drive the change. Danny, how about you? What gives you hope? I think firstly, all of the other young people who are speaking out, all of the school students and Erin, who are just as young as I am and speaking out against this. And then on top of that, all of the women and survivors and activists who are older than me and came before me and did the groundwork, you know, Jenny, Danya, I didn't grow up with a lot of women of colour in these spaces to look up to. And Saxon, you have inspired me for a very long time. And, you know, it's you guys who give me hope. It's knowing that you guys have done the groundwork for us and you've changed it. And I wouldn't be where I am today without the work that you guys have done. And we're just going to keep carrying that flag for you. Amazing, Danny. So I know Erin's doing the fist. I feel I felt like running into Erin, who's doing this from our uh, other bit of our office to give her a like solidarity uh, thing as she was talking. Saxon, what gives you hope? I believe you made me go last. I'm like crying over oh, here. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was actually no. impressed. We hadn't, we hadn't teared up in <laughs> anger or emotion. No, let it all, let it all flow out. You can no. rage as well if you want. Have a bit of rage and hope at the same time if you need it, Saxon. It's all <laughs> Well, I think like everyone else here has said, like uh, I think having these conversations gives me a lot of hope, you know, not that long ago, this conversation would have had as many amazing people speaking, but not as many amazing people in the audience willing to listen. Um, and so I think that is something that's truly amazing. But I, I think what Danya said is just absolutely took the words out of my mouth. The sacrifice that so many people continue to make to be able to, you know, make this space amazing, especially the young people that are in here, Erin and Danny are incredible. Like, you know, they are sitting here in high school, other people that will come after them get to just enjoy their ridiculous high school years. And they're doing so much work so that those people don't have to do what they're doing now. And I think it's amazing. Totally amazing. It's also incredible to show the strength of the movement to say, Chanel, you're not even being mentioned as the young person, right? Because there are like more youth than you involved in this movement now. And that is like a, that is like a cool thing. Like I feel confronted by being one of the older ones, but it's like, you know, I think, and we look at who else is on this call and I can see women that have been pushing these movements around the start of women's refuges in New South Wales and engaging with these issues. And to me, that gives us strength. It's a beautiful connection. And I think being able to have people that are working in direct service delivery engaging with advocates and activists is how we solve this because to me coming together to be able to take the voices of survivors the experiences of people who have experienced sexual assault and sexual harassment along with the incredible activism skills advocacy skills expertise and frontline support and being able to take that into our parliaments, into our workplaces is crucial, right? That is how we are gonna achieve that change. Now, people are saying in the chat, what's next? What are we gonna do? Like, we can't cover that in the next three minutes, but what I will say, is that um, all of the women who have joined us tonight on this panel are doing incredible work locally, nationally, pushing an agenda and making change. So what we're gonna do is like a thing to be able to send back to everybody that's joined this call is to say, you know, here you can, you can follow them on Instagram, you can connect on Twitter, you can join this organization, you can fund this project, you can sign this petition who can do this work because what we want to do is not feel like we are holding this for we for me when I got elected to parliament um back in 2015 I saw that I was being given an opportunity to exist and represent a progressive community in Newtown that could drive change on issues that we felt like were crucial and to me part of my incredible privilege in this role is I get to meet and connect with incredible women like the women we have had on the panel this evening and I want to say that I don't want to own these connections or these relationships I want to make these connections so that we can achieve the change and so we will send to you all of the things you can do to back in and become activists and more engaged and more supportive of all of the movements and the change that all of these women are leading and if there's ever anything you need us to do in the parliament or resource or support, then 
that offer is always there as well because we are only going to do it if we all remind each other. I want to also give a shout out. I know there are lots of people on the um, panel tonight, sorry, that are not on the panel tonight that are actually amazing people that could have been on the panels that are representative of other organisations and groups. And I want to say thank you so much for that and feel free to put in the details of your organisations and groups into the chat as well. There's two things I need to do to finish off. The first is that um, this is the first time we have held such a huge meeting style Zoom call. So I'm going to ask you to do a really dorky thing and uh, answer a like weird poll that is about to pop up in your Zoom um, because, you know, we've never done this before and it just seems a little bit out there. So apparently a poll is going to pop up, I think. Maybe it's going to pop up. Does anyone see a poll? Amazing. Yeah. All right. Do you want to just take a second to answer that poll? See how you're going? Amazing. Don't worry to the panellists. We didn't say who was your favourite panellist. It's not a uh, popularity contest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the final thing that I would like to do is basically just say a massive, massive thank you to the panellists who have joined us tonight and contributed their expertise, their emotional labour, their absolute passion and determination to achieve change. It is not easy to do this work. It is not easy to be a survivor of sexual assault or sexual violence. And it is certainly not easy to stand up against the misogyny and the patriarchy and the bullshit that women have to stand up to, to be able to be safe and participate freely and equally in our community. And so I wanna ask you all to do a very awkward thing at this point and unmute yourself and give them a very loud and chaotic clap on Zoom. So unmute. I don't want any of these emoji Zooms. Thank you all so much for joining. We're going to let you log off now so you can like slowly leave the Zoom like we're in a real room. You can log off. Thank, Thank you all you. so much for joining. We'll be in touch with Thank all you. the amazing things you can do to help us achieve Thank our to-do list. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much, everybody. Bye. Thank you.